Coach Irwin and Matt today. Let's give them a big DEF CON welcome. Okay, good morning, good morning all. Uh, thanks for being here early for some of you who don't have kids yet. Um, so just a quick introduction. So I'm Erwin, uh, that's uh, Matthijs or Matt, if you may want to call him. Uh, we both work at uh, Nixu, uh, which is a Finnish company, but we actually work for the Dutch uh, branch office. So we're based in Amsterdam. And as you can see, it took us quite some, some time to get here. Um, so what is it what we're gonna talk about? Well, we're gonna talk about wireless industrial sensor networks, um, but it's always good to look back at like what has been done before. Um, as you can see, um, the earliest research was already done in 2009, more academic research about potential attacks. And um, the attacks were, were, were described, but not demonstrated. There was no information how you could actually uh, recreate the attacks yourself. And um, there, there's, and that, that, that sort of continues because then in, in 2015, there was actually a PhD student in the Netherlands who did also similar research and actually tried to build a, a, a tool to, to interact with these networks and um, he, he didn't really succeed. So he was, was using SDR based uh, systems initially. In the end, he, he didn't really succeed in, in actually uh, capturing traffic or, traffic or modifying traffic. So then we came along and we did a presentation at S4. Um, and then we already opted the idea to actually create a toolkit to be able to um, actually uh, capture traffic, inject traffic, etc. cetera. Um, that, that's a couple of years ago, but uh, unfortunately we never got around to actually doing it because we, we soon uh, left the company we were, we were working at at that time. Um, and in, in the meantime, we had, we had Blake Johnson again um, using SDR-based approach uh, to, to interact with these networks, but again, no code was released, no tools, nothing. So, I mean, these networks are around for quite a while, but still there are no tools. And, and we strongly b believe in, uh, in Wright's principle, which is written down there. Uh, the guy, Joshua Wright, uh, who actually uh, said that, well, if there are no tools, uh, security will not improve. So, we, have, we were actually attending DEF CON uh, last year as, as just um, and not as a speaker, but as a regular visitor, and we're like, well, let's build those tools because it's still missing. Um, and just to give you an idea um, what, what, the, what the industrial revolution is uh, for these type of systems. So first, uh, we're talking about industrial control systems here. So first we had, had the air pressure systems in, in, in 1940s. Uh, 1950s, they start using analog current loops. Um, in the meantime, I'm well familiar with that part because it actually allowed me to destroy some of the, the, the components we were testing. Um, but later on, they actually started creating digital protocols. So on top of the current loop, they, they implemented, for instance, the heart protocol, which you may be familiar with or not. And, and, and in late 2000s, they, they thought, well, let's do it wireless. And they created two uh, standards, uh, wireless heart and ISA 111A, commonly named as ISA 100. So, is anybody familiar with these protocols? Have ever heard about it? No? no? Not that many. Okay. Well, so it's, it's for most people, it's very niche, um, but still, it's, it's interesting. And if you're wondering where, where these systems are being used, uh, for instance, oil and, and gas fields, uh, you, you can see those transmitters. So you see the, the blue ones, they're actually field devices. So those are transmitters, and, and they're actually measuring things like uh, pressure or temperature and they transmit wirelessly to, uh, to the central system. But we get to that. Um, well, since it's an industrial uh, control loop, process control loop, I think it's good to, to sort of explain how that works. So basically you have a flow transmitter all the way on the right, and um, there's a, a signal being sent to a central controller, and that, for instance, indicates the flow rate uh, that's called the process value, and that process value is actually uh, checked against um, a set point, and, and if it's within re range, nothing happens, but if, if something needs to happen, there's actually control output, so that's the bottom line, and then the valve is actually changed in, uh, from, from opened or closed to, to adjust the flow. Um, so this is the typical uh, process loop. 
And what you see is that typically up till now, um, mainly the measuring part is done wireless, either with wireless hard or ISO 100. Um, so if you look a bit, a bit more at, at wireless hard, it's actually um, the same hard protocol, the application layer, but they, they uh, created a wireless, uh, wireless stack for it. Um, so it's, it's compatible with, with the hard devices out there. Um, it does use encryption, so it's not the most uh, insecure uh, control uh, protocol. Um, but it's, it's symmetric encryption, and, and we get to that in, in, in uh, the later slides a, a bit more. Um, it's based on, on, on wireless technology from, uh, from DOS networks, because they are also the ones creating the, the radios, so the radium system on the chip. Um, and, and you see there's, there's, there's a couple of vendors who actually built equipment uh, for, for wireless hard. So ISO 100, there, there are fewer companies actually um, supporting it. Uh, so the main driver is Yokogawa and also Honeywell. Um, and there's actually a, like a whole bunch of standards it's, it's, it's based on. So there's a 6 low uh, WPAN, there's IPv6, surprisingly, and UDP on, on the top of that. And um, it's, it allows you to tunnel under uh, other protocols. So it's not like uh, they, they took an existing protocol with, as with wireless hard and, and built a wireless stack for it, but you're able to, to tunnel. And so it's, it's, it's more uh, vendor neutral. And the, the mainly uh, it's developed by a company called Nevis, um, who, who created the, the system on the, on the, on the chip uh, initially. But now there are more uh, chips out there from, from different vendors. So what does a typical topology look like? Um, well, these are mesh networks. So there is not, well, there is a central system that orchestrates the mesh. Um, that's the gateway, network manager slash security manager. Typically, that's just one box, one device, as you can see on the right. Um, but there, is, there, are, there are field devices out there. And there's, there's a couple of, um, different ones you can see in the picture. So you have the field devices, the devices that actually measure stuff, um, that, that have a, a wireless transmitter themselves, or you have the situation where, for instance, where you have a heart, uh, heart enabled transmitter, and then you can add an adapter and, and they can communicate. But since it's a, a, a wireless a mesh network, also the field devices can route traffic for other devices. So it's not point to point, uh, only. Um, and you have, on the, the right-hand side, you have the wireless hard handheld, and that's being used to actually configure uh, the devices. So before they can join the network, you have to configure them, and then uh, they, they will join uh, the, the network. So if we look at the protocol stacks, um, you, you can see that, that on, on um, the hard side, there's, there's actually, on, on, on the left-hand side, you, you can actually um, see the, 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 the traditional heart, and, and um, on the right hand side, you see the, the wireless heart. So it's based on ADA to 15.4, um, but they, uh, they used only a very thin layer of, of that protocol. But everything they build on top is specifically wireless, wireless heart. And, and one of the things uh, to, uh, to pay attention to is, is the channel hopping, because we get back to that later. That, that, that's something that was challenging to, to solve. Um, and also on, on the ISO 100 side, we see a similar thing. So it's again a, a thin uh, 802.15.4 layer, and then the, you see the whole protocol stack uh, on top with uh, UDP, et cetera, et cetera. And although it's not listed in, in this, um, in this overview, they also do channel hopping uh, as well. So to, to summarize to the similarities, because we have two wireless protocols out there which are somewhat similar, and, and we thought, well, can we build a toolkit to actually uh, assess both of those, uh, of those systems? So they both have the, they share the 802.15.4 layer, although they uh, both have a different version, sub-version. And they both work at 2.4 uh, gigahertz. Um, and they both do time-slotted channel hopping. And, and the reason they do that, so they hop from channel all the time, and the reason they do that is actually um, to minimize interference because you, I mean, these systems are being used in, 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 uh, in plants, in industrial sites. So there is a lot of interference from other systems that are, that are out there. 
And also to, uh, to mitigate multipath fading. So that means that if um, a signal gets reflected back, uh, you might cancel out the signal. And because you hot the channels, you actually prevent that. Uh, because there's a lot of metal around uh, large, uh, large storage um, containers, etc. So there, there's a lot of reflections. So they both have a central network, a security manager. Uh, to orchestrate the communication between the nodes. It doesn't mean that the node itself can also route traffic for other nodes, but there is a central point that controls the network. Um, so we thought, well, we can probably build a, a sniffer for, for both protocols. Um, so we, we um, um, if, if we look a bit more at, at, at the, the things they share is that they actually use the, the, this exact same E. Uh, the ES CCM star uh, encryption. Um, so at the network layer, they use it for integrity only. So either 2.15.4 is only integrity. But at the transport layer, they, they, they apply encryption. And um, both systems have actually a joint process where you, they actually uh, share the, the, the encryption key. Uh, and that's a handshake with the network manager. So that's the central component. And um, for wireless heart, it's, it's, it's only uh, shared secrets. So that, that's already an interesting thing that, yeah, symmetric encryption. So how do you get the key across and, and, and where do you store it? Uh, and, and ISA 100 also supports certificates, although we haven't seen it being used. Uh, so so they, the uh, ISA 100 supports both uh, shared secrets and, and certificates. And there's a lot of different keys. Um, so if we start at the left, uh, you have the ISA 100. Um, the, the top three keys are actually used during, during the provisioning phase. Uh, so you have the global key, the key open, key global. Um, and, and during the provisioning phase, the master key is being, um, is being shared. And, and from that master key, they derive two keys, the D key and the T key. Um, it's not so, so important that you remember all the different keys. It's just to show there's a lot of different keys out there. Uh, and the same is true for wireless heart. So the well-known key is used at, um, at the network layer. That's actually not an encryption key, but an authentication key, because they don't do encryption at the network layer. Uh, and, and there's a network key, then the join key, uh, for the join, which is being shared during the join process. And, and derived from that, there's two session keys, so both for broadcast and unicast. So first question, of course, is how do you get key material? Um, well, one of the things you could do is actually read documentation, because there's a lot of default keys out there. And uh, I must admit that since we've done the research two years ago, uh, a lot of the documentation is not publicly available anymore, because we back then already published some of the keys that are, are uh, default keys. And, and it seems a lot of the documents have, have vanished. So not all the keys we list here you can still publicly find. But uh, we're pretty sure uh, that we initially uh, found them somewhere. Um, and uh, ISO 100 specifically also has uh, over-the-air provisioning of devices. So that's also a weak part where you could sniff, um, could sniff the transaction uh, or, or the handshake. Uh, but then you need to be able to sniff, of course. And previous research we've done, we actually took apart transmitters and looked at if we could um, interface directly with the, with the radio shock, because actually there's, there's multiple components and, and there is a radio shock on, on there. And uh, it turned out that they actually had JTAG SPI enabled, at least for, for, for wireless hard, because back then we only looked at wireless hard. And uh, we showed that you could actually sort of locate where the, where the encryption key is. And, and worst case, you can always dump the complete firmware and load it onto another similar device, and then you can also join the network. So there's a couple of ways to actually obtain those keys. Um, so if you, if you are a plant manager and you're getting rid of old equipment, also pay attention to the last one, because you might not erase those keys, and if it ends up on eBay, somebody might buy it. So. Um, there's a couple of default keys for wireless hard. We haven't located any default keys for ISA 100 yet, so that's why I'm only list wireless hard keys. Uh, the first one you see a lot, and that actually has to do with, with Dust Networks, who will create the, the socks, and that's why they use Dust, Dust Networks rock all, uh, at a lot of locations. Um, so it's, it's a, you can see it's a 16 bytes uh, hexadecimal, hexadecimal key, so it's quite long. Um, but you can see they, they use a couple of values uh, 
out there. And, and the third one, the Emerson one, is also interesting because that's taken from an uh, Emerson wireless hard gateway. And if you do a factory reset, it actually sets the key like this. So you see a lot of zeros. So the key space is really, really small. So if you ever have reset those devices and use the default key, you might be able to easily brute force it. Um, and, and sometimes you can see it's also the name of the vendor. So the last one is actually exactly Anders and Hauser, um, but in hex. So if we um, look at the sniffer hardware, uh, we first looked what's out there. Uh, because we, we, we want to build something new. Uh, and, and, and during previous research, we used the Beam Logic, which basically is, is just a sniffer, but it, it, it uh, sniffs on all 16 channels simultaneously. Um, so it has no injection support, a very basic wire shark dissector, and it's quite expensive. It's the, the box on the, on the right. Um, so, yeah, it's expensive and also quite limited what you can do with it. Uh, initially, we thought about using the Atmel RC, Ra RC Raven uh, stick because also the regular transmitters used, uh, use an AVR-based uh, system. Uh, but already reached end of life, and it's very hard nowadays to find Atmel Studio somewhere. Um, so then we looked for other options, and we went on to the B-Kit from NXP. Um, and by default, that already allows you to sniff on one channel. Um, with the standard firmware, although the standard firmware is not open source, but that also reached end of life. So we continued our search for another one, another stick from NXP. So this one is still supported, has a free IDE, and uh, it allows you to sniff on a single channel. It's quite powerful, um, and, and we need that for the channel hopping that uh, Matthijs will explain later. And um, you can actually modify the PCB a bit to, to put an external antenna on it. It's extremely small, so I already ruined the device trying to do it. But it is possible, and you could go to war driving. Um, yeah, there's, there's documentation out there and examples, but only with a few important omissions here and there. So I just want to show you the default uh, application that, that's already provided by them. I hope you can see it. Uh, so basically this is the default application. You just select a channel, so it's sniffing 802.15.4. Uh, you can start Wireshark, and you can at least see packets. See, you, you can see the packets, but if you click on, on actually um, on, on, on um, the bottom side, you can see that it's just data, so it doesn't have a dissector for this protocol. But the basis is there. We can already sniff packets on one channel, so that's a start. So then we figured out, okay, how does this actually work? Uh, because there's a, there's a whole SDK around it. Um, but actually it's, it's, it's relatively simple because the hardware is detected as a virtual COM port, uh, both on Windows and Linux, so that's already a plus. Um, but they implemented their own protocol, which is called FSCI. Um, it's developed by NXP, and it's a communication protocol over, over serial. Um, and there is a host SDK available with Python bindings. Um, but we thought, well, we don't want to ship a tool with the whole host SDK around it. We might run into legal issues, so can we dire communicate directly? And um, as it turns out, we, we can actually uh, do that. Um, so we, we created a driver for, for Killerbee, and Killerbee can directly drive this, uh, drive this stick now, so we don't need a full SDK anymore. Um, so this is what it looks like uh, schematically. So the K KW441Z is actually uh, the M Cortex. Uh, there's a second one on there uh, where you can actually load uh, different bootloaders and that way you can also uh, provision new, um, new firmware on the device through USB. So you actually have the MCU Expresso, it's called. MCU Express or IDE and actually allows you to develop so, uh, firmware for this device. So, thank you, Aaron. So we wanted to about, uh, to build something uh, more powerful than was uh, out there. So we thought we we found our hardware platform that we could uh, develop on. Uh, so we start building the tool set and the first thing we uh, wanted to accomplish is uh, 
I will sniff the packets ourselves and uh, um, not relying on uh, the SDK that uh, came along with uh, the hardware. Um, so actually we built a driver for the Killer B framework. Um, Killer B because um, it shares uh, the same uh, uh, RF layer, the 802.15.4 uh, protocol. So that seems uh, quite a good match. And uh, we also developed um, uh, extensions uh, to Scappy, so uh, we were also be able to uh, to inject packets uh, rather than just listening on the traffic. Um, and to bring uh, a packet sniffing to the masses, uh, we also decided uh, to build uh, Wireshark detectors for protocols Wireless Heart and ISI 100. So we'll show you a short demo. This in action. So you can see we use uh, the ZB Wireshark uh, utility that comes with uh, with, with Killer Bee. And here you see we are picking up traffic. In this case, ISA 100. And you see also the Wireshark dissector in action on the left of the screen. You see we uh, decode the packets. So the next challenge was. Uh, um, the channel hopping problem. So like Aaron told, um, the protocol uses a fast-based channel hopping uh, algorithm. And when s starting developing uh, and studying this toolkit, we thought, okay, uh, there is a new extension for 802.15.4. If I rem remember correct, uh, correctly, that's uh, the D amendment, which also uses uh, uh, time hopping mechanism. So we thought, well, maybe we could use that because that primitive was already supported by, uh, by the uh, SDK. Uh, but it turned out uh, that uh, that was not usable at all. So <laughs> uh, we really got to get our hands dirty and uh, write you know, a pretty uh, uh, extension to the firmware itself. So none of us having a embedded development background, that uh, yeah, turns out to be quite a challenge. So if I mean uh, fast-paced channel hopping, uh, that means that uh, the intervals you see here on, uh, on, on this slide are at 10 milliseconds. So every 10 milliseconds, uh, you get the frequency change. So yeah, in order to keep up, yeah, you have to, um, yeah, think through how you're going to accomplish that. Um, as I said, yeah, we need to rely on the firmware itself, on the hardware, because uh, yes, you can change channels from the host system, but as soon as you send an FSCI command to the USB device, uh, the time in, uh, the time slot already has lapsed. So that doesn't work in practice, so you really need to implement this in firmware. So, uh, <laughs> that uh, we needed to deep dive into uh, embedded development, which was uh, new for us. And yeah, there are a couple of approaches you can take. So um, for this type of, uh, of devices, you can rely on a real-time operating system. Um, yeah, there are uh, quite a few around. Uh, one of them is FreeRTOS, for instance. Uh, but there, it, is, it is pretty... Um, so it, it's pretty... Um, um, complex in the sense that um, it, it's, yeah, it's not a full-fledged operating system, but it has a, has a task scheduler that will uh, preempt 
So that means that it will interrupt your code right in the middle of, uh, of your function, and you can get all kinds of, uh, of challenges, like race conditions you have to deal with. So you need to mess around with the semaphores and other synchronization mechanisms. Um, the other approach is uh, use a bare metal task scheduler. Uh, the, that, that, that will not uh, interrupt right in, into your uh, code section, uh, but as soon as, uh, as the task is scheduled and is running your code, you're responsible for releasing resources. So that means that in practice you have to, uh, to make sure that your code doesn't run for longer than two milliseconds. Otherwise, you will start. Uh, you will start other tasks, and that means that, uh, for instance, uh, there's a separate task for uh, collecting the packets. Uh, yeah, you can uh, make sure that uh, you change channels, but if uh, you don't pick up the, the packets, you don't have anything at all. So, as I said, yeah, it, it requires uh, uh, quite some discipline and, uh, in programming. Um, well, the, the upside is that you uh, can achieve fast execution because you don't have the overhead of a real-time operating system. So this is uh, what, uh, what it looks like. These are the modules in the firmware. A part is uh, offered by the framework itself, so you have a memory management uh, a task that is taking care of uh, allocating the heap and stuff. You have the Mac file layer uh, that's uh, taking care of uh, picking up the packets from the radio. And uh, uh, the serial manager, obviously, because these packets need to go to the host. Uh, you have a bunch of timers that you can program and uh, will wake your task so you can do actually something useful with these packets. And of course, uh, everybody needs blinky lights. So uh, on the right side, you see actually what we uh, needed to do. Um, the MacFi layer was only uh, partially useful. Um, we needed to implement the channel hopping, and yeah, that is, that is you know, called the Mac extension layer because we needed to uh, obviously extend these capabilities. Uh, on top of that, uh, we actually get to the industrial protocols, ISA 100 and wireless hard, and we also needed to parse information out of these packets uh, on that uh, layer because we uh, needed the information in order to calculate when uh, the, a particular time slot occurs where you're interested in. So how to do this? Um, 10 milliseconds. Uh, if you program a timer uh, to, to, to wake up your task every 10 milliseconds, we found out that you're always too late because you're never guaranteed to get a wake-up call within every 10 milliseconds. It's either 10, 10 milliseconds or 11 or 12. And when you start uh, tuning into the channel, you are too late. So what we did is um, we parsed uh, the packets that came along. So in the advertisements of both uh, wireless protocols, you, you get information. Uh, where the slots of interest are, for example, the join slots. Uh, these are the time slots where um, field devices actually can tune in to, to start a handshake uh, for um, uh, getting onto the network. Those are of particular interest, also from a, a tech perspective. So uh, what we started to do is, uh, well, tune in advance, so if our um, a tuning code gets called. Uh, we measure, okay, the, the next uh, slot of interest is uh, three time slots away. Okay, we'll tune in right now. And, uh, well, the, the other task will take care of picking up the packets there. So that gives us some more room. Like, for instance, uh, around 40 milliseconds uh, rather than 10 milliseconds. 
So that uh, turned out to uh, work pretty well. And we'll show you how we actually achieve channel hopping. Again, ZB, ZB Wireshark. We had to hack in a non existing channel. C channel zero means that uh, we activate the channel hopping in the firmware. And as you can see, we get quite some more traffic here than in the first case where we only were tuned into one particular channel. And I don't know if it's readable, but here you can see that on the left part that we actually hop to different channels. So, what can you do if you can tune on uh, these uh, intervals of interest, these time slots? Well, these are a few um, attacks that have been theorized and now we can execute uh, in practice. Um, one is uh, just jam the, the signal on, uh, uh, by, by sending garbage uh, to, uh, on a particular channel. And uh, you can block, for example, advertisements. And if you do that successfully, no new devices can join the network. Uh, because I don't, uh, they, they are not able to synchronize with the network. Or even existing uh, field devices will uh, lose at some point the synchronization with the network. So in practice that means that uh, the field devices uh, are unable to send their process values. And uh, yeah, depending on, uh, on what control system you have, uh, you can uh, wreak havoc. Um, of course, being able to inject traffic, you can also transmit fake advertisements. So you can enter uh, fuel devices to join your network rather than the existing uh, network. And yeah, we'll give a short demonstration of how you can jam. No? Yeah, okay. So here, is, here you see the victim who's happily receiving advertisements. And we turn to the attacker, which will start our tool to jam the signal. We found the network, and on the victim side, you see a few packets coming in, and next, it comes to a halt. Silence. So that's all uh, nice that we can do things uh, without uh, actually being on the network. But suppose you have some, uh, gathered some keys, or you found these in the manuals, or you brute force these. Well, you can do all other nasty stuff. Um, the way this works is that the, the uh, the encryption actually is derived from a nonce that has, uh, for a large part, uh, predictable values. So there is, a, in the advertisement data, there is a, a counter that you need, and that can be sniffed from the network without being authenticated. Um, but even if you don't know uh, how to <clears throat> Um, you can mess with uh, this nonce value because there is a replay. <coughs> Thank you. 
there is a replay protection uh, in place uh, that's supposed to uh, to protect against uh, obviously replaying uh, fake values. Uh, but the thing is. Um, if you mess with uh, the, uh, the the nonce, and you'll uh, guess a, a valid uh, nonce, and it will be picked up uh, by uh, by uh, the device. If it's larger, it's say it's much larger larger than uh, the timestamp that is uh, currently in the network. <laughs> It will re you reject all packets from valid devices, so you can really bring down enti an entire uh, sensor network this way. Of course, if you uh, also have uh, access to other key material, for example, when capturing a joint process, and you have access to the session keys, you are free to uh, to mimic a real field device, and you can really mess with process values. And that's uh, where it's getting really scary. So, um, to summarize, what did we learn along uh, the road? This uh, these net these uh, sensor protocols are a highly unexplored area. And uh, as we, as in the introduction, uh, we suspect that this is mainly due to the fact that no uh, real good, uh, real good tools exist. So yeah, we picked up uh, that task and hope that we will, uh, uh, we can promote other researchers to uh, to, uh, to explore this in very interesting area. So uh, yeah, we intend to to. Uh, to release uh, the tool set we, we created. And uh, yeah, another thing we want to, uh, to give uh, to the asset owners who, we, we, who deploy these systems, um, we see a trend that, uh, that people are getting very confident with this technology because it's around for 10 years and it has never been hacked. So, must be secure, right? So, you see a trend that uh, these protocols are not only being used for monitoring systems, but also for co control. Uh, yeah, I would like to, <laughs> to uh, well, probably that's not a really good idea. <laughs> so, they might want to reconsider that. All right. We have uh, some time for questions, five minutes I see. So, uh, um, this is, these are the future research areas, these are the, the topics uh, we want to uh, expand upon. So we'll um, support more attacks that have been theorized so far, but no tooling exists. Uh, we want to create uh, support for war driving industrial networks. Uh, when we ordered the hardware, we were happy to see that it had a, an um, a external antenna connector, but once it arrived, it was not on the board, so we were kind of disappointed. And of course, with the capability of uh, actually interacting with this network and the capability of injecting packets, um, yeah, there, we are free to actually fuzz these protocols from the radio side of, uh, of these systems. Okay, well, thank you for your attention, and we can take some questions now.